Chapter 15 The minute they got the herd penned, Dish felt himself getting restless. He had a smoke, leaning on the gate of the big corral. He knew he had a clear duty to stay with the horses. Though the darky was obviously a superior hand, he could hardly be expected to hold the place against a swarm of bandits. The problem was that Dish could not believe in the swarm of bandits. Under the red afterglow, the town was still as a church. Now and then, there was the bleat of a goat or the call of a bull bat, but that was all. It was so peaceful that Dish soon convinced himself there was no need for the two men to waste the whole evening in a dusty corral. The bandits were theoretical, but Lorena was real and only 200 yards away. Leaning on the gate, Dish had no trouble imagining favorable possibilities. Jake Spoon was only human, and he was over sure of himself at that. He might have rushed his suit. Dish could understand it. He would have rushed one himself, had he known how. Perhaps Lori had not welcomed such boldness. Perhaps she had recognized that Jake was not a man to depend on. By the time he had mulled the prospect for 30 minutes, Dish was in a fever. He had to have another shot or else carry some sharp regrets with him up the trail. Some might think it irresponsible. Captain Call, for one, certainly would. But he could not stand all night in chunking distance of Lorena and not go see her. Well, it all looks safe, he said to Dietz, who had seated himself against a big water trough, his rifle across his lap. Quiet so far, Dietz agreed. I reckon it'll be some while before anything happens, if anything does, he said. I believe I'll just stroll over to that saloon and bathe my throat. Yes, sir. You go along, Deed said. I can look after the stock. You just shoot if you need help, Dish said. I'll get back here in a minute if there's trouble. He took his horse so he wouldn't be caught afoot in the event of trouble and went trotting off. Deeds was just as glad to see him leave, for the young man's restlessness made him an uncomfortable companion. It was not a restlessness other men could talk to. Only a woman could cure it. Dietz had had such restlessness once and had had no woman to cure it, but years and hard work had worn the edge off and he could relax and enjoy the quiet of the night if he was left alone. He liked sitting with his back against the water trough, listening to the horses settling themselves. From time to time, one would come to the trough and drink, sucking the water into its mouth in long draughts. Across the pen, two horses were stamping and snorting nervously, But Dietz didn't get up to go look. Probably it was just a snake that had snaked too close to the pen. A snake wasn't going to fool with horses if it could help it. The possibility of attack didn't worry him. Even if a few vaqueros did make a pass at the town, they would be nervous, sure of being outgunned. He could sleep. He had the knack of going in and out of sleep easily and quickly. But despite the long night and day, he wasn't sleepy. Relaxing, at times, was just as good as sleeping. A sleeping man would miss the best of the evening and the moonrise as well. Deeds had always been partial to the moon, watched it often, thought about it much. To him, it was 
a more interesting and a more affecting thing than the sun, which shone on every day in much the same fashion. But the moon changed. It moved around the sky. It waxed and waned. On the nights when it rose full and yellow over the plains around Lonesome Dove, it seemed so close that a man could almost ride over with a ladder and step right onto it. Dietz had even imagined doing it a few times, propping a ladder against the old full moon and stepping on. If he did it, one thing was sure. Mr. Gus would have something to talk about for a long time. Dietz had to grin at the mere thought of how excited Mr. Gus would get if he took off and rode the moon. For he thought of it like a ride, something he might just do for a night or two when things were slow. Then, when the moon came back close to Lonesome Dove, he would step off and walk back home. It would surprise them all. Other times, though, the moon rode so high that Dietz had to come to his senses and admit that no man could really ride on. When he imagined himself up there on the thin little hook that hung above him white as a tooth, he almost got dizzy from his own imagining and had to try harder to pay attention to what was happening on the ground. Still, When there was nothing to see around him but a few horses sucking water, he could always rest himself by watching the moon and the sky. He loved clear nights and hated clouds. When it was cloudy, he felt deprived of half the world. His fear of Indians, which was deep, was tied to his sense that the moon had powers that neither white men nor black men understood. He had heard Mr. Gus talk about the moon moving the waters, and though he had glimpsed the ocean many times by the Matagorda, he had not been able to get a sense of how the moon moved it. But he was convinced that the Indians understood the moon. He had never talked with an Indian about it, but he knew that they had more names for it than white people had, and that suggested a deeper understanding. The Indians were less busy and would naturally have more time to study such things. It had always seemed to Dietz that it was lucky for the whites that the Indians had never gained full control over the moon. He had dreamed once, after the terrible battle of Fort Phantom Hill, that the Indians had managed to move the moon over by one of those little low hills that were all over West Texas. They had got it to pause by the edge of a mountain so they could leap their horses onto it. It still occurred to him at times that such a thing might have happened and that there were Comanches or possibly Kiowa riding around on the moon. Often when the moon was full and yellow and close to the earth, he got the strong feeling that Indians were on it. It was a fearful feeling one that he had never discussed with any man. The Indians hated the whites, and if they got control of the moon, which was said to control the waters, then terrible things might happen. The Indians could have the moon suck all the water out of all the wells and rivers, or else turn it all to salt like the ocean. That would be the end, and a hard end at that. But when the moon was just a little white hook, Dietz tended to lose his worries. After all, water was still sweet, except for an alkaline river or two like the Picos. Perhaps if the Indians got on the moon, they had all fallen off. Sometimes Dietz wished that he could have had some schooling so as to maybe learn the answers to some of the things that puzzled and intrigued him. Night and day itself was something to ponder. There had to be a reason for the sun to fall, lie hidden, and then rise again from the opposite side of the plain. And other reasons for the rain, 
the thunder and the slicing north wind. He knew the big motions of nature weren't accidents. It was just that his life had not given him enough information to grasp the way of things. And yet Indians, who could not even talk a normal language, seemed to understand more about it even than Mr. Gus, who could talk a passel about the motions of nature or anything else he wanted to hear talked about. Mr. Gus had even tried to tell him the world was round, though Dietz regarded that as just joke and talk. But it was Mr. Gus who put his name on the sign so that everyone could read and realize that he was part of the outfit. It made up for a lot of joking. Dietz rested happily by the water trough, now and then glancing at the moon. The ground shadows hid him completely, and any vaquero foolish enough to try and slip in would get a sharp surprise. Dish himself got something of a surprise when he walked into the dry bean, for Lorena was not alone as he had been imagining her to be. She sat at a table with Xavier and Jasper Fant, the skinny little waddy from up river. Dish had met Jasper once or twice and rather liked him, though at this time he would have liked him a lot better if he had stayed up river where he belonged. Jasper had a sickly look to him, but in fact was as healthy as the next man and had an appetite to rival Gus McRae's. There's Dish, Lorena said when he came in the door. Now we can have a game. Lippy, as usual, was kibitzing, putting in his two cents worth whether they were wanted or not. Not unless... He's been to the bank, we can't, he said. Xavier cleaned Dish out last night, and he ain't active enough to make his fortune back in one day. Don't mean he can't take a hand, Jasper said, giving Dish a friendly nod. Xavier's cleaned me out, too, and I'm still playing. We all got weaknesses, Lippy observed. Wants is playing poker for credit. That's why he can't afford to play, pay his piano player an honest wage. Xavier endured these witticisms silently. He was in a worse mood than usual, and he knew why. Jake Spoon had come to town and promptly deprived him of a whore, an asset vital to an establishment such as his and an out-of-the-way place like Lonesome Dove. Many a traveler who might not ordinarily come that far would because of Lori. There was no woman like her on the border. She was not friendly. But because of her, men came and stayed to drink away the night. He would not be likely to get an, another such whore. There were Mexican women as pretty, but few cowboys would ride the extra miles for a Mexican woman those being plentiful in most parts of South Texas. Besides, he himself bought Lori once a week, if not more. Once, in a period of restless enthusiasm, he had bought her six times in five days, after which, being ashamed of his extravagance, if not his lust, he abstained for two weeks. It was a happy convenience having Lori in the place and a fine change from his wife, Therese, who had been stingy with her favors and a bully to boot. Once Therese had denied him anything resembling a favor for a period of four months, which, for a man of Xavier's temperament, was a painful thing. He had been required to hunt Mexican women himself during that period, and had come close to feeling the wrath of a couple of Mexican husbands. By contrast, Lori was restful, and he had come to love her. She did not exhibit the slightest fondness for him, 
but neither did she raise the slightest objection when he felt like buying her, a fact Lippy was deeply resentful of. She refused to be bought by Lippy at any price. Now, Jake Spoon had spoiled it all, and the only way Xavier could vent his annoyance was by winning money from Jasper Fant, most of which he would never collect. Where's Jake? Lori asked, a shock to dish. His hopes, which had been soaring as he walked through the dark to the saloon, flopped down to boot level. For her to inquire about the man so shamelessly bespoke a depth of attachment that Dish could barely imagine. It was not like she would ever inquire about him, even if he stepped out the door and vanished for a year. Why, Jake's with Gus and the boys, he said, sitting down to make the best face of it he could. It was not much of a face, for Lori had never seemed prettier to him. She had pushed up the sleeves of her dress, and when it came her turn to handle the cards, her white arms all but mesmerized him. He could hardly think to bet for watching Lori's arms and her firm lips. Her arms were plumpish, but more graceful than any dish had ever seen. He could not think what he was doing he wanted her so much. It caused him to play so badly that in an hour he had lost three months' wages. Jasper Fant fared no better, whether from love of Lori or lack of skill, Dish didn't know. Didn't know and didn't care. All he was conscious of was that somehow he would have to outlast Jake, for there could be no woman for him except the one across the table. The very friendliness with which she had treated him, stung him like a scorpion bite, for there was nothing special in it. She was almost as friendly to Lippy, a pure fool, and with a hole in his stomach to boot. The card game soon became a torture for everyone but Lori, who won hand after hand. It pleased her to think how surprised Jake would be when he came back and saw her winnings. He would know she wasn't helpless, at least. Xavier himself didn't lose much, he never lost much, but he wasn't playing with his usual alertness. Lori knew that might be because of her, but she didn't care. She had always liked playing cards and liked it even better now that it was all she had to do until Jake came back. She even liked Dish and Jasper a little. It was a relief not to have to hold herself out of the fun because of what they wanted. She knew they felt hopeless. But then she had also felt hopeless enough times waiting for them to work up their nerve or else borrow two dollars. Let them get a taste. Dish, we might as well stop, Jasper said. We'll barely get out of debt this year as it is. I'll take a hand, Lippy said. I might be rusty, but I'm willing. Let him play, Xavier said suddenly. It was a house rule that Lippy was not allowed to gamble. His style was extravagant and his resources meager. Several times his life had been endangered when strangers discovered he had no means of paying them the sums he had just lost. But Xavier had lost faith in house rules since it had also been a house rule that Lorena was a whore and now she wasn't anymore. If a whore could retire so abruptly, Lippy might as well play cards. What's he going to pay me with when I win? Lorena asked. Sweet music, Lippy said cheerfully. I'll play your favorite song. It was not much enticement, Lorena thought. Since he played her favorite songs every time she came in the room as it was hoping his skill at the keyboard would finally move her to let him buy a poke. She wasn't about to start that, but she did play him a few hands. The cowboys were too sunk even to drink. The boys said goodnight to her politely, hoping she would think kindly of them, but she didn't. Boys didn't interest her as much as cards. 
Outside, Jasper paused on the street and had a smoke with Dish. Hired on yet? Jasper asked. He had a mustache no thicker than a shoestring and a horse that was not much thicker than the mustache. I think so, Dish said. I'm working for these Hat Creek boys right now. They're thinking of getting up a drive. You mean they hire you to play cards? Jasper asked. He fancied himself a joker. Oh, I was just resting, Dish said. I'm helping their darky guard some stock. Guard it from what? From the Mexicans we stole it from, Dish said. The captain went off to hire a crew. Hell, Jasper said. If the Mexicans knew the captain was gone, they'd come and take back Texas. I reckon not, Dish said. He felt the remark was slightly insulting. The captain was not the only man in Texas who could fight. He can hire me if he wants to when he gets back, Jasper said. He probably will, Dish said. Jasper had a reputation for being reliable, if not brilliant. Though aware that Dish might be touchy on the subject, Jasper was curious about what had happened to change Lori so. He looked wishfully at the light in her window. Is that girl got married or what? He asked. Every time I jingled my money, she looked at me like she was ready to carve my liver. Dish resented the question. He was not so coarse as to enjoy discussing Lori with just any man who happened to ask. On the other hand, it was hard to see Jasper Fant as a rival. He looked half-starved and probably was. It's a scoundrel named Jake Spoon, Dish said. I reckon he's beguiled her. Oh, so that's it, Jasper said. I don't believe I've heard the name. I believe I have, in fact. Actually, a a pistolero of some kind, ain't he? I wouldn't know what he is. Dish said in a tone that meant he was to let Jasper know that he had no great interest in discussing the matter further. Jasper took the hint, and the two of them rode over to the Hat Creek pens in silence, their minds on the white-armed woman in the saloon. She was no longer unfriendly, but it seemed to both of them that things had gone a little better before the change. (laughs) 